mother, mother, green lady. We're covering today's top box of news. Okay, we'll start with this. Later on this month, on the 24th, unbeaten up-and-comer of Germany, Sarigma. She's set to return to action against journeywoman Jane Kavulani. Making the most of her time, what time remains in this year. Sarah Liegman, originally, was supposed to be appearing on the undercard of Shields vs. Marshall. I'm not quite sure if they scheduled her to fight two times in the same month, though given that it's very early in her career, she's a 4-0 prospect, it's possible they scheduled her two developmental fights in the same month. It's just as likely that they found her something else to do after the card fell through due to the Queen's passing. Queen Elizabeth. Sarah Ligmund debuted as a professional in September of last year. She fought two times last year. She's already fought two times this year. This will be her third fight in the year of 2022. They are good to come, Sporting a professional record of four wins, no losses, and no draws with one knockout. 20 years old, campaigning at or around featherweight. She's registered as a 122-pound fighter, a super bantamweight, though she actually fights... She actually fights at featherweight. That's 126 pounds. That's where Amanda Serrano holds the WBO and WBC titles. That's where Sarah Mahfoud of Denmark, she's got the IBF, at least for the time being. I don't think she's going to have it for long. Nope. And that's where Eric Cruz holds the WBA title. That's where Sarah campaigns. Sarah, who comes from a diverse combat background, I vaguely recall hearing that she transitioned from kickboxing over into boxing. Aus Deutschland. Sarah Liegman is a lot more put together than your average 4-0 unbeaten up-and-comer, your oh. average 4-0 prospect. She shows real ability, real good speed in those hands, good snap in those punches. She punches with intent. She's a spiteful fighter, seems to have a bit of a mean streak, real bouncy, very good in and out game, good set of legs under her, good variety. Manages the distance well. She knows how to judge distance. She knows her range. And she is already exhibiting these qualities at only 4-0, and just 4-0, and no losses, no draws, one knockout. This kid's definitely got a future. Sarah Liegmund is one of two unbeaten German up-and-comers in today's featherweight division that exhibit a lot of ability and a lot of promise. The other is amateur standout prodigy Sophie Alish. Yeah, she's another one. She's good. Sophie Alish, who's the same age as young Sarah Liegmund. She's about 20 years old, same as Sarah, but she's a little further along in her career. She's actually got two times as many fights as Sarah. She sports a professional record of eight wins and no losses with no draws. And both fighters represent the next wave, the next generation of featherweights and perhaps super featherweights. Because they're both so very young, and based on their physical dimensions, they could see themselves one day moving up from 126 to 130, maybe as high as 135 pounds. Sarah Liegmund, like Sophie Leash. Uh, she's a ways out from fighting for an alphabet title. They both are, but the next wave of featherweights really is exciting because you're talking about Sarah Liegman, you're talking about Sophie Leash, you're talking about the United Kingdom's own Raven Chapman. And you think about all those fighters at 122 pounds, the talented ones like Ali Scottney. Cotford. Kind of fighter might one day see herself moving up to featherweight. Unbeaten up and comer Ellie Scottney, unbeaten champions like Sigaling Lafarve, who holds the WBO title at 122 pounds. One day she might move up in weight and campaign at featherweight. I see that the talent pool at or around these weights, it is becoming deeper, much deeper over time. Sarah Liegman, like many others, represents that new wave, that talent pool. She's going to be returning to action later on this month on the 24th and what's being billed as a 10-rounder. Sarah Liegman's first. This is a first time for everything. Keep your eyes peeled for that later on this month. In men's heavyweight news, I'm sure most of you have heard by now, per a tweet from Michael Benson, Anthony Joshua has now accepted all terms to fight Tyson Fury on December 3rd. His management company, 258 Management, have confirmed this was agreed on Friday. They added, due to the Queen's passing, it was agreed to halt all communication. We are awaiting a response. To a lot of people, this still appears to be a high-stakes game of chicken between the two teams. That's how some people feel about it. Some. Others are more optimistic, more hopeful that they'll actually be able to get this fight over the line before this year is out, even if it's by through unconventional means. A fight this scale, a fight this size is not normally negotiated in full view of the public eye. You ask me, Tyson Fury was just throwing shit at a wall hoping something sticks. Something did. Something might have. 
Whether Anthony Joshua is simply calling his bluff and waiting for him to bulk, or he's serious and he means to face him on December 3rd, in either scenario, Anthony is trying to prove something, prove himself, at what is a most inopportune time for him, for him as a fighter, because he's coming off of two consecutive losses, so he can't be riding high. What kind of headspace is he in? Canadian boxing scribe Jeff Jeffrey said it best. In these conditions, Fury will win. For a 12-round fight, you're supposed to have a three-month rest period. Joshua fought in August 22nd. Plus, you need an eight to ten week training camp for a fight like this. Joshua won't have that and will be very tired. He said yes for the money. I think that's where I disagree with Jeff. I agreed with most of Jeff's thoughts. This is most inopportune, but I don't think Joshua is motivated by the money here because he could fight somebody else in December and get a fuck ton of money. I think Joshua is trying to prove something prove something to his doubters, his critics, prove something to himself. That's what I think. He is either trying to prove that Tyson Fury and Frank Warren are full of shit and they never wanted to make this fight, or he's trying to prove that he belongs, that even though he lost two times to Alexander Yusik and he suffered that shock upset lost well over a year ago, two, three years ago, to Andy Ruiz, he's still one of the best in the world. He's either trying to prove that Fury's full of shit or that he belongs. In any event, he's trying to prove something. Quite disaster. That is far too quick a turnaround to take on yet another top three, top two heavyweight in the world, really. It boils down to Usyk and Fury as the top two guys in this division, in the heavyweight division here today. And you just fought one of them. Now you're about to fight the other after the other beat you two times. They said Tyson Fury was throwing shit at a wall, hoping something would stick. Something did. I maintain my original position. If you're Tyson Fury, you're telling yourself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to issue out a public call-out. And at best, I get this guy in the ring at a very inopportune time for him. And at worst, I don't get him in the ring and I publicly shame him for it. And use that to promote my next fight, which in all likelihood would be against some low-level guy that nobody wants to see him fight anyway. Just throwing shit at a wall, hoping something would stick. And it looks like something did. Now, Anthony's got no shortage of fans that are going to root him on going into this thing if he does, in fact, end up fighting Tyson Fury on December 3rd in Cardiff, I believe it is. They're going to root him on and they're going to support him and that's all well and good, but on the face of it, the bookies are going to have him an underdog. I don't care how much you like him, these are not favorable circumstances. Experimental corner situation with Angel Fernandez. Who only recently assumed this role of head trainer, head coach, after Anthony Joshua sacked Rob McCracken. And will Robert Garcia be staying on board for this endeavor, for this excursion, taking on Tyson Fury later on this year? Is he going to stay on board? The corner situation seems experimental. The circumstances are less than favorable. The guy's coming off of two back-to-back -back losses, so what kind of headspace is he in? You know what kind of headspace he's in. We saw what kind of headspace he's in immediately after the Usyk fight, the outburst that he had. The meltdown. Is that the reason for all of this? Is that that the reason he's accepting Tyson Fury's terms when he really doesn't have to. What the hell does he think he has working for him going into this Tyson Fury fight? What does his team think? What are they thinking underneath it all? You know, Eddie Hearn says it all the time. He's not Anthony Joshua's boss. He's Anthony Joshua's employee. He works for Anthony Joshua. There's no way we get to this point unless Anthony himself is the one that wants to get there. There's no way we get to this point unless Anthony wants to get to this point. If this fight actually does get over the line the way some are anticipating it would have to be because this is what Anthony really wanted, even if it's not what's best for him. Not in this moment. His contemporaries, his rivals, have been very selective throughout their careers. Very strategic. You don't think that Tyson Fury calling this guy out off of two back-to-back -back losses over the course of two years. You don't think that's strategy? That is strategy, my friend. Whether you talk about the soft matchmaking in Deontay Wilder's career for the first seven years of it, or Tyson Fury's two-year hiatus from the sport while he was under investigation for Nandrolone found in his system after the Christian Hammer fight. When you look at when you look at Anthony's contemporaries, they've been a lot more strategic over time than he has. He's been a lot more straightforward. He's got his pride. But you know what they say about pride? Pride comes just before the fall. Is it pride that leaves Anthony Joshua feeling so inclined to enter into this fight here and now at what is the most inopportune time 
for him to do so. Is that what we're looking at? Is it pride? Or is he simply calling Tyson Fury's bluff because he's expecting him to bolt? I'm telling you, I still feel like Tyson Fury was throwing shit at a wall, hoping something would stick. And something did. Perhaps initially, when he issued out that call out, he wasn't actually expecting that Anthony would take him up on his offer. But when he saw he was willing, when he saw that he would, he decided to capitalize because now is the best time to fight Anthony Joshua when he's coming off a of two back to back losses and he may not be confident, may not be in the right headspace for a fight like this. For me, it's still a little bit hard to believe that this fight happens under these circumstances. But boxing at times does have a way of surprising you. I would be surprised if this fight actually takes place before this year is out on the proposed date, December 3rd, because of how unfavorable it is for Anthony Joshua. But that seems to be the direction that he's going in. And if it happens, no one can accuse Anthony Joshua of shying away from a challenge. But hasn't that always been the case? All the offers he made to Deontay Wilder, the offer he made to Tyson Fury when Tyson Fury was on the bounce, on the rebound, attempting to reintegrate himself into the sport. I mean, that was always the case. Nobody can accuse this guy of shying away from a challenge. They can't. That's why he's great for the division. He's been great for the division. He's been great for the sport. But allow me to impart an inconvenient truth. The deck is very much stacked against him going into this fight if he does go into it on December 3rd. Oh, you might want him to win. You might, but want doesn't always get. I don't have any illusions about that fight the same way I don't have any illusions about this one. This weekend's mega match, the trilogy between Canelo Alvarez and Gennady Golovkin. Eddie Hearn says, Triple G will go to war in the third fight. No way it goes 12 rounds. Everything I'm seeing from Gennady Golovkin looks like a man possessed. Hearn told co-hosts Barack Bess and Akin Reyes during his weekly spot on their show. Right up at 168 pounds, I'm telling you now, the benefits to Gennady Golovkin being up at 168 as opposed to shredding himself down for the 15th year of his career at 160, he looks like an absolute beast. He's coming with everything to beat Canelo next week. And Canelo better be ready. I know how hard Canelo's trained for this fight because he's coming off a defeat and he wants to win this fight bad and he wants to knock out Triple G. Hearn anticipates another highly competitive bout between them, between Canelo and Golovkin. He also thinks their third fight will be more entertaining than each of their first two meetings. Next week in Las Vegas, you better get ready to see an all-out war between these two, Hearn said. The build-up's gonna be epic. They're gonna go at it all week, but I'm telling you now, when that bell rings at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, these two will not take a step back. They will go to absolute war in this trilogy, and this fight will not go 12 rounds. No way. No way this time. And you're gonna see the best of the three fights. Forget about Bivol, forget about Gilberto Ramirez, all eyes on Las Vegas next week. So Eddie Hearn thinks that Golovkin not having to cut down to 160 for this fight is going to benefit him. I've heard that sentiment expressed in many circles. I've expressed it myself here in this channel as a possibility that Golovkin not having to cut that eight pounds, that extra eight to make middleweight, he might feel rejuvenated, a little bit stronger, not leave as much in the gym. But there's another side to that argument. There's another side to the coin. And now retired two division champion, champion. Tim champion. Bradley champion. talked about that when he gave his insights on this same fight. I, I think it's a terrible move going to 168. 160, he was strong. 160, he was big and stronger than everybody. 168, nah, I don't think he's going to be that strong, to be honest with you. He's going to be a little bit slower. You know, uh, I think gas tank going to be a bit, little bit more drained. Uh, you know, people say the added weight is great. Sometimes the added weight ain't great. Sometimes that added weight isn't great. You know, it slows you down a bit. Your timing is a little bit off. You know, it takes some time to get acclimated at that new weight class. That's eight pounds, dog. You're going up. Eight pounds. That's tough, man. And then you got Canelo coming off a loss, too. Stop, man. He going he gonna to mess around and might even stop Triple G. I want you to think about what Tim Bradley says here. That sometimes the added weight isn't beneficial. Was the added weight for Canelo up there at light heavyweight in his very last fight? Was that beneficial for Canelo? Did he look faster, sharper, stronger? Is that what he looked like? Did the added weight at light heavyweight, not having to cut down to super middleweight, did he look better than usual? Did you hear what Tim Bradley said about acclimating to a weight and how it's important that carrying the extra weight, it might make a guy a little slower. His timing might be just a little off. For a 40-year-old fighter who's nowhere near the fighter, the same fighter, 
that he used to be four years ago when he last faced Canelo Alvarez. These are problem areas. Reaction time. How fast can you get those hands high? Fast enough to block punches? Head punches, body punches. How fast can you tuck those elbows? Can you tuck them faster than Canelo Alvarez? Can you tuck them faster than the time it takes Canelo to connect with body shots? Split the guard with uppercuts. The idea that Gennady might share a similar fate to Caleb Plant, who was put down by Canelo Alvarez. It doesn't sit well with a lot of people. They can't quite see it. They still think he's got a cast iron chin, but it's entirely possible that Canelo Alvarez takes him out this time because Gennady's 40 years old and he will be carrying more weight into this fight than any other fight he's had before it, including those two Canelo Alvarez fights. So when you think about the gradual decay of time and what that does to a fighter's reflexes, his reaction time, coupled with the added weight that Gennady is going to be carrying. Doesn't normally carry that much weight into a fight. Look at what carrying additional weight into a fight did to Canelo in the Dimitri Bivol fight and realize that this weight, where this fight is taking place, this trilogy between Canelo and Gennady, it's arguably Canelo Alvarez's best weight. You know, Dimitri Bivol had a very pesky style, and him being a natural light heavyweight, Canelo couldn't put a dent in that guy. He couldn't, but it also didn't help that Canelo Alvarez looked a bit flat, looked a bit spent and gassed. Could the added weight he was carrying, weight that he doesn't normally carry, could that have been it? It's possible. Both Canelo and Gennady, they're still action fighters, that's what they are. And when you put two action guys in the ring, you're gonna get an action-packed fight. So I don't doubt that this fight will yield a fan-friendly aesthetic. It might even be more fan-friendly than the first two fights. That's actually possible. The first fight was more of a boxing match than a war. The second fight was actually more of a war. The second fight was, and the third fight might be as well but in the third fight it is entirely possible that due to the gradual decay of time coupled with some other outlying factors Gennady might bite the bullet he might get stopped